about what we're here today for. The um, limited assistance representation is uh, a bit of the, the new wave representation. It's a fairly new practice. Um, today we're going to talk about how you can get certified in LAR, but in fact, once the, you have viewed this training today, you are in fact certified to practice LAR. All of the materials, and I'm doing this first because I've just heard that people at the last training didn't, um, didn't quite understand this. All of the materials that we cover today are also on the Volunteer Lawyers Project website. And I am Joanna Allison, an attorney at the Volunteer, website, <laughs> Volunteer Lawyers Project, and our website is www dot v l p n e t dot org and everything we talk about today is on that website um, and any questions that you might have can be answered there and if not you have access to there to my email which is j allison at v l p net dot org So going back to the beginning, I am Joanna Allison. I'm a staff attorney at the Volunteer Lawyers Project, and I've been there for quite a while, um, during which time LAR was scoffed at and then um, considered and then ultimately adopted in this state um, with a lot of help from the man next to me um, and who is going to be speaking to you about LAR and has now become a very popular uh, way of practice and has been a major conduit, I would say, for getting more people representation in the court. We had a problem with pro se litigants. Um, it's always a problem when a person has to go before a court on their own because, it's, as you know, it's complicated and it's scary. And LAR helps us as a legal services agency to provide help for more people. But in addition to being a, an excellent tool for pro bono work, LAR is shaping up to be an excellent tool for attorneys who are out to trying to make a living at their practice. There are lots of folks out there who can't afford uh, a full-time lawyer for their case, but they don't qualify for legal services. What they can afford to do is hire someone for a part of their case and get that piece handled, which will then help them move on to the next piece or may even be the final uh, dispensation of their case for a lot less money but a lot more business for attorneys so as you're listening today look at it from all those perspectives how it can assist if you're interested in in um, pro bono work and how it can assist in making a living in your own practice when the VLP first began to work with the LAR model we did it through our courtroom clinics this means that a person an attorney volunteers we give advice to pro se litigants. Over time, we've um, gotten permission to go into mediation with them, and then even some court appearances. With LAR, every one of those steps became actually um, approved by not just the local court that we're dealing with, but by the SJC. And those rules are also in your materials. I want to quote one of my um, former co-workers who was one of the pioneers in this. Uh, recently, she said, Practicing LAR is not necessarily for beginners. It's, you need to know the law that you're practicing in. It's like jumping on a moving train. You need to know where that train is coming from, where that train is going, and what speed it's passing you by. So that when you jump on and handle one piece of that case, you know the, the ramifications of what you do and what your client decides at that point. Uh, therefore, I put in the plug for the Volunteer Lawyers Project, which is a wonderful opportunity to handle these cases, to learn the area of the law, and to practice with the mentor and the um, backup of experienced attorneys. And then you're not going out there practicing without understanding what's going on. So when you look at that VLP website that I've already given you, make sure you look at the volunteer opportunities, the court clinic opportunities, the types of cases that we handle, and the types of pro bono opportunities across the board that we offer. And I think you will find something there that will interest you and will work with your um, goals and, and your schedule. Also remember that any one of us, and we're all listed on that website, at VLP is interested in talking to you about your interests, your concerns, and your, um, your plans. 
it's a great community to be a part of. The whole group of folks who volunteer for VLP, the folks who work at, vol at VLP themselves have been wonderful about wanting to mentor and um, move people along in their, in their practice. So I'm very proud of, of that fact above all is that it's a supportive environment there in the volunteer world. Today we're going to have um, two breakout sessions, so we're going to spend an hour and a half or so talking to you and fielding questions about LAR for the certification training. The two breakout sessions today are the BMC, the Boston Municipal Court, on the debt collection cases, and that is going to be staying in this conference center. So if that's the breakout session that interests you, this is where you will be. Um, for those who are here for the housing court breakout session, it's going to be in the Claflin Center up on second floor. Um, I will mention that again as we get close to the end of the training. We did this training just about a month or so ago, and at that point, we, the two breakout sessions were the land court and the probate court. All of that is on the VLP website. I mean, we have a YouTube channel. <laughs> so you've read the book, now see the movie. Um, pl please um, look on the VLP website. It will take you to that YouTube channel. And you can actually watch this training, the one that we're recording today, or the one that we recorded um, a, a month and a half ago. Um, you can watch it again and again and again. Uh, when you are finished with this training, you will consider to be certified. There is a certification form in your materials. Sign it. Keep it. There are some courts that ask for it and some that don't. In the probate court, you certainly have to send in your um, certification form. The housing court has specifically said that they will not keep those, that by making a notice of appearance in a limited assistance representation, you are certifying that you have attended the training. The other forms that are included in your materials, but also on the VLP website for your use, are notices of appearance, and um, as Judge Winnick always likes to call it, the notice of disappearance, your withdrawal, um, which you can use to, um, in your own practice. Each court seems to have a little bit different form that they want. We've included the ones that we have so far in, in these materials. As any new ones come about, we will include those on the VLP website. So um, I'm going to turn this over to um, Ned Notice McConnerty, who is at Hemingway and Barnes. He's been involved in this through his work in the probate court and um, his work with legal services for as long as I've been here um, as a private attorney, really making things happen for legal services, and we're very grateful for that. We're especially grateful that he keeps coming and keeps doing these trainings and with a cheerful heart. So. <laughs> Very cheerful, actually. Uh, Allison doesn't understand. It's a lot more fun than being in the office, so uh, happy to be here. Um, and happy to continue to put effort into what is, I think, a wonderful cause. Uh, this all started for me about 10 years ago when Mary Ryan was president of the BBA and appointed me to do a, a task force on unrepresented litigants. <coughs> um, as uh, Joanna mentioned, I'm at Hem and Wayne Barnes, and our practice there is heavily oriented towards uh, probate practice. Um, I did quite a bit of divorce when I first arrived. Uh, now I do more will and trust uh, disputes. But I'm in the probate court a lot, and uh, the probate court is always on the cutting edge here in Massachusetts and across the country with pro se litigants. And it was very obvious to everybody that we had uh, huge numbers of pro se litigants, and it wasn't working out well for the litigants who were getting less uh, just results than they could. Uh, the judges were frustrated with the state of the files they were dealing with and all the time they spent educating pro se litigants. And uh, those of us were frustrated because we were sitting uh, in the benches waiting to be called while the judge dealt with uh, endless pro se litigants who hadn't served the other side and uh, were taking up a lot of our time. The whole process wasn't working, so we did this task force and we came up with a number of recommendations. And one was this limited assistance representation, which at that time was known as unbundling. And essentially, the way you look at it is, it used to be that you had to come in and uh, take a kind of a prefix uh, 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 menu when you came in, when you come into a restaurant. Soup to nuts, everything, one price, and you didn't have any choices. LAR is really a la carte. You can come in and out of a case uh, you can choose to do it, the client can choose to have you do it, but what it allows you to do is to break the case into its separate components and to be involved for part of it, but not all of it. 
one of the things that was coming up for divorce practitioners was that uh, under the old rules and under Rule 11 of the Rules of Civil Procedure, if you filed an appearance of any description, there was only one kind of appearance. That is a general appearance. You were in for everything. And you were in that case uh, until the judge let you out. You didn't have a right to, even with your client's agreement, you couldn't just file a notice of withdrawal. You had to get, go and get the court's approval. Oftentimes, the courts didn't want to give you approval. Uh, judge Ginsburg, uh, retired judge from the probate and family court, uh, has been part of this training program a number of times. And he'll tell you that was the last thing he wanted to do, was let a lawyer out of a case. And uh, so he would keep the lawyers in the case, even if they weren't getting paid, even if the client didn't want them, even if the lawyer wanted nothing to do with the case. You were just stuck with the whole thing. And what that meant was, from the attorney's point of view, especially in a divorce case, or oftentimes a tough eviction case or a tough case at the BMC, you end up in a situation where uh, you get, you're looking at the case, you have to have a worst case scenario. How much time could this case take? I better get a retainer that's going to cover me for most or all of that. Because if I don't, I'm going to get stuck in the case, the judge won't let me out, and the client will stop paying. Divorce lawyers were taking $25,000 retainers regularly. Uh, the clients were very reticent to uh, give that kind of uh, money up front. Uh, the lawyers would, uh, in some cases, get the retainer, use up the retainer, and then not get paid anything more. If there was a trial uh, pending, trial date pending, the court would keep them in anyway. All the way along, the result was that fewer lawyers were appearing than could. So we figured it was better for everyone, the court, the pro se uh, litigants, and for the lawyers to have more lawyers involved in the cases. So that was our goal, was to get, find a way so that more lawyers would be involved in probate and family court cases. Uh, we did that through this LAR, and now the other courts, uh, all of the Superior Court hasn't signed on yet, and the appellate courts haven't signed on yet. Uh, all of the other courts have. Uh, so uh, you're here specifically with respect to the BMC and the Housing Court, uh, which have each adopted their most recent rules. So um, let me just say uh, another word, which is uh, this is great for pro bono, because a lot of lawyers don't want to do pro bono because they might get signed in and have the case from hell, uh, and they get stuck in it. And instead of uh, spending 10 hours uh, giving a day to pro bono, uh, they end up giving their lives to pro bono, uh, to one case that may require them to stay in. This way, uh, lawyers volunteering can be sure that when they go to court for a day and file limited appearance, at the end of that day, they're free to go. They've helped their client as much as they can, but they're free to go at the end of the day. So it works out really well for that. But we're expecting that this is going to be a way to make money. That is, from the lawyer's perspective, also a high priority because the more that lawyers are doing this and making money from it, the more lawyers are going to be in court, the more help they can provide for clients. So we hope uh, that you make a lot of money. Now, on the way over, you know how they have those uh, uh, new computer information boards in the, uh, in the news and the elevators? I saw on the way over uh, a list of the deceased uh, celebrities who made the most money last year. Last year, I was surprised to see Liz Taylor made $210 million, even though she's dead. Uh, I can't tell you that you're going to be making that kind of money. Maybe you're better off trying to become a celebrity, but uh, this is a way to add some cash. Uh, the reason being that uh, if you know that you're only going to court for one day and you figure that from your experience it might be three hours that it would take you in court that day, you can agree on a set fee with the client uh, for the time you spend that day and collect it ahead of time. So if your hourly rate is you know, $200, you think it's going to be three hours that day, charge the client $600. Sometimes you'll get out on an hour, sometimes it'll take you four hours, but you can get paid up front with a flat fee and uh, make sure that way that you get paid for the time you're involved and make sure that you make some money with it. Um, so I've talked a little bit about uh, limited assistance representation. But really what it is is uh, uh, well defined by the Supreme Judicial Court rule. And the materials you have 
that have been given out here are the results of really years of training uh, on the probate and family court side uh, using the best materials we could find from other states that have been doing this. And uh, so you've got a, uh, everything you need in this booklet, which interestingly, over the course of the years, has become uh, thinner uh, and more efficient. We've given you only what you need and really is something you can sit down and read from cover to cover without too much trouble. So uh, I would encourage you to use this as your, as your resource. There are a number of things that came up with uh, limited assistance representation. I've mentioned the issue about the general appearance that you used to have to file under Rule 11. Uh, but there were other uh, nuances. One is, for years, uh, office lawyers were doing, uh, were doing limited assistance representation on business matters. It wasn't unusual if you were a corporate or real estate lawyer to have someone walk into your office and say, I've got a purchase and sale agreement. Uh, can you just review it for me? Sure, uh, that'll take me an hour, $300. Uh, I'll be happy to review it, tell you what I think about it, make any necessary changes. And that was the full engagement. Then the client would go off on their own. Um, you couldn't do that in the context of a court appearance because of this rule that required you to be involved with a general appearance. So what this does is really allow you to do in court what lawyers have been doing in their offices for a long time. The other question that came up that was a long uh, controversy here in Massachusetts is what's called ghostwriting. Uh, so what ghostwriting really is, is preparing pleadings for pro se litigants that are going to appear in court uh, on the hearing for which that pleading is being prepared. And there was a big dispute. Uh, the Mass Bar Association Ethics uh, Committee uh, gave the opinion that it was not okay for a lawyer to prepare a pleading uh, without indicating on it that it had been prepared by a lawyer and to give it to the lawyer, the client to go into court. The Board of Bar Overseers said, under some circumstances, ghostwriting was fine. The problem was that judges consistently had clients appearing in court pro se with pleadings that had obviously been produced by lawyers. And then the clients were asking, asking for the sympathy from the court or, or an extension of time because they weren't represented by counsel. The opposing lawyers were very upset at that as well. They would go in representing their clients and there'd be this pro se litigant on the other side with a pleading that had obviously been prepared by a lawyer who was behind the curtains giving advice and not, uh, not coming out. So we wanted to deal with uh, ghost writing and we wanted to deal with the, uh, the uh, problem that results if you just file a general appearance. So after uh, years of uh, listening to people's concerns, uh, hearing from people in Maine where they've been doing this LAR for a number of years uh, and being reassured that it was going well there, the Supreme Judicial Court uh, it, uh, adopted a rule. And that SJC rule is in your materials uh, at uh, page 76. And while you have a uh, general uh, understanding of what limited assistance representation is from what I've just told you, and perhaps what you've heard elsewhere, there are some materials here, and a lot of materials on the web about what was being done in California and Maine and other places. This is what's being done in Massachusetts. So it's important to read this Supreme Judicial Court rule. This is the fundamental touchstone for all of the work that you'll need to be doing. Um, and the important thing here is um, if you look at the SJC rule on page 76, it talks about limited assistance representation. And what it says is that you can, uh, a qualified attorney, and that's a, a defined, uh, that's a defined term, may limit the scope of his or her representation uh, of a client if the limitation is reasonable under the circumstances and the client gives informed consent. So let's just spend a minute with those concepts. A qualified attorney. A qualified attorney is uh, defined under this rule as an attorney that has gone through a training. Uh, and this training today qualifies you as an attorney to do limited assistance representation. So at the end of this, you will be a qualified attorney. It also says that you can limit your representation if the limitation is reasonable under the circumstances. That requires some thought on your part. 
Uh, the materials that talk about whether or not uh, assistance is reasonable under the circumstances talk about a number of concepts. If you're doing limited assistance representation, the critical thing is for the client to realize what you've agreed to do and what they're going to have to do, what the division of responsibilities is. And if you don't get that straight, it's never going to work and you're not going to end up with a happy client. So you have to make sure that the client understands what it is that you're going to do, what it is that they are still going to be responsible to do. Under some circumstances, that kind of a division is not reasonable. So for example, if the client comes in and says, I want you to handle the child custody dispute in this matter, I'm going to handle the valuation of the pension plan. Um, that's not going to work. Valuation of the pension plan being a very complex uh, question in a divorce case. Uh, that is a very technical concept. It's not reasonable to put your client in charge of that part of it while, while you're doing uh, the part that has to do with uh, custody and the children. You might also have a client that uh, either because of language or, or other challenges uh, really doesn't understand how to represent him or herself, doesn't understand the division and responsibility, and uh, it's not reasonable at that point for you to be dividing the case up uh, with limited representation if the client really isn't able to get it. So those are a couple of the concepts to be concerned about when you're talking about which cases are appropriate and which cases aren't. Uh, you might also be in a situation uh, where you've got a case that's so far down the road and is so mixed up, messed up at this point that you just don't feel like you can, um, uh, you can handle it. Um, I had a, somebody come to me recently because there was a dispute in connection with an init initial private offering. Uh, they had al already been uh, held in contempt for violating contempt san uh, discovery sanctions. Uh, the other lawyer had been sanctioned. Uh, there was a contempt hearing, another contempt hearing, uh, and a hearing on a uh, request to default this client that was coming up in four days. I wasn't getting involved in that case. That's not a case where it would be reasonable to say, all right, I will handle that one hearing for you, but you're going to have to handle everything else. So you've got to use some good judgment to, in terms of what is reasonable to, uh, to divide up or not divide up. The other thing the SJC rule requires is that there be informed consent. So you need to make sure that your client understands what limited assistance representation is and how it's going to work. Now happily, we've got a lot of materials here that are going to help you with that kind of a determination. And if you walk through these materials, use these materials, you're going to find out that uh, limited assistance representation uh, is, uh, is something that you can do and that informed consent will result from the process that we're going to uh, lay out for you. When we first brought up this question of limited assistance representation, a lot of people had questions about, first, uh, whether or not this was ethical. Uh, under the old rules, you just said to the client, jump on my back and I'll carry you across the finish line. So you were responsible for everything, uh, all the way from beginning to end. You didn't have to really draw a lot of lines there. Now, when you're saying, I'll handle this for you, but not that, that for you, you're defining your representation in a fundamentally different way, and some lawyers were worried that that might be uh, uh, a violation of the rules of professional conduct, or that they might end up in trouble at the Board of Bar Overseers. On our task force, we had uh, an assistant bar counsel uh, who looked at those issues specifically and said he didn't see any reason uh, why there would be uh, any question with respect to the ethical rules uh, that couldn't be overcome. It's really not different from a general representation as long as you're aware of what your responsibilities are and you do the informed consent. Happily, uh, I made a call to that assistant bar counsel earlier this week and he reported that in the four or five years the probate court has been doing this, there have been no uh, reports to the Board of Bar Overseers uh, as a result of lawyers uh, engaging in alleged unethical conduct in limited representation. And that actually is consistent with what we heard in Maine and what we've heard, what we hoped would be true here, which is if you work at making sure that your client is informed and you're clear what you're going to do and what they're going to do, then 
you've got a client that understands what the situation is and isn't going to be uh, expecting you to do things you haven't agreed to do. Uh, that eliminates a lot of reasons for disagreements with your client and a lot of complaints to the Board of Bar Overseers. Also, fewer disagreements about fees. When I was doing divorce cases, a lot of the complaints to the Board of Bar Overseers came up because uh, you uh, agreed to do the case, you took the retainer, uh, and then the retainer ran out, and the client expected you to keep representing them in the case, and soon there was a bill that was you know, ten, twelve thousand dollars and they couldn't pay it and you had this tension between lawyer and client that uh, oftentimes resulted in the lawyer being aggressive about trying to collect the fee and that's when they ended up at the Board of Bar Overseers. This is going to be a, a method of practice that's going to result in fewer complaints to the Board of Bar Overseers, not more. Second, there were a lot of questions about whether or not this would be covered by malpractice insurance. The answer is, it is. Uh, we had Rick Yurick from Morrison, Mahoney and Miller on our task force who defends lawyers and legal malpractice claims is his uh, full practice. Uh, he looked at it, uh, talked to the insurance companies that were providing coverage. This is very simply the practice of law. It's covered by your policy. You don't need to have any additional rider or anything else. So those couple of things are very reassuring to lawyers that uh, wanted to uh, begin doing the practice of law. So let's look back again at that SJC rule, which is uh, page 57. I'm sorry, not 57. 76. 76. Um, and actually, the easiest uh, thing to talk about first, I think, is the uh, provision uh, about ghostwriting. And that's uh, included in paragraph four, which you'll see on page 78. The idea with ghostwriting was, again, we wanted to encourage as many as the involvement of as many as lawyers as possible, create a way for lawyers to uh, provide services, uh, make sure that the lawyers could charge fairly for the services, but also make sure that the pleadings were better prepared uh, and uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the client had the advantage of those. The disadvantage of all this, as I mentioned, was the fact that the uh, lawyers on the other side in the court felt it wasn't fair or really uh, honest for lawyers to be for clients to be coming in with materials prepared by lawyers if they didn't say they were prepared by lawyers. Uh, other states have resolved this issue uh, by allowing ghostwriting, but requiring the lawyer who does the ghostwriting to put their name and address on the pleading. We were very uncomfortable with that. A number of lawyers said to us, I'm not putting my name on a pleading that goes into the court when I'm not there to argue it, or when that might be mis misconstrued as a general appearance. Um, I don't want to be called from the court asking questions about that, about that pleading. So we decided that you didn't have to put your name and address and your BBO number on a pleading that you ghost wrote, uh, but you do have to put on it this um, endorsement, which is provided here in the SJC rule, it has to say, quote, prepared with the assistance of counsel. So that it's clear to everybody uh, that this, there was a ghost writer involved with this. Does that eliminate the possibility that you might be asked to come in and explain something? No, it doesn't. But you're not going to, your name and phone number are not going to be right there uh, on the uh, front of the pleading. And we've had no problems with clients using uh, pleadings that were designated as prepared with the assistance of counsel. Um, so uh, there are some basic rules that you ought to uh, follow if you're going to be doing ghostwriting for people. One, again, informed consent. You have to make sure the client knows why you're preparing this pleading and how it fits in the context of what you're doing. So if that's going to take you some time, figure that into your fee. Uh, but then you prepare this pleading, and you're going to be subject to uh, the requirements of Rule 11 in the sense that it has to be prepared in good faith. If you have a reason to know that the pleading is being prepared based on an affidavit that your client uh, prepare or obtained fraudulently, you know, you're going to be in a problem whether you put your name on that pleading or not. 
Um, so make sure that you, you can file the pleading in good faith. Then, in order to make sure that that pleading in the form that you've prepared it is the one that gets filed with the court, you ought to keep a final copy of what you prepare if you're going to give it to the client to file. Make sure you mark it. Final copy given to client for filing and keep it separate and apart so that if there's ever a question about what's been filed in court and whether you had a role in it, you know exactly what it is you've done. I had a kind of a clever uh, idea on that to, uh, in an earlier training. One of the lawyers who's doing a lot of LAR said, very simple, I file it with the court. If there's a ghost written pleading, uh, I uh, send it to the court uh, with a cover letter, filing it with a copy to the client, and that way I know for sure exactly what's been filed with the court. Um, and <clears throat> by the way, uh, there are a number of people that are doing uh, limited assistance representation. Uh, we did this training uh, a month ago uh, for the housing court and the probate court. We had 130 people here. Uh, we, did a here we did a training earlier this week at MCLE. Uh, there are now two people in Cambridge that have opened practices doing only LAR. And we had, uh, on one of our other panels, we had somebody that was using LAR as a big part of her practice and was marketing it on her website, saying, I have this new way of practicing. Uh, you don't have to decide to hire me for the entire case. You can decide as we go along how much you're willing to pay and whether or not I'm doing a good job. And uh, this is an important new way to practice. I'm qualified to do it. And she's finding people coming in asking her specifically about LAR. So it is catching on. Um, a week ago, Monday, Judge Ginsburg and I went down to Connecticut uh, to talk to the Rules Committee down there because they're thinking of adopting uh, uh, LAR down there, which they've never had. Uh, a lot of resistance from the bar down there, all the same questions we had up here, and we were able to tell them, don't worry about it. It worked in Maine, it worked in Florida, it worked in California, it's working in Massachusetts. So this is a new wave. This is what's happening, and we're going to see more and more of it over time. So make sure you read that uh, SJC rule carefully, particularly with that one paragraph. If you're going to be doing, uh, if you're going to be doing ghost writing, um, the best way to go through most of the other requirements there for the SJC rule is to go through the materials that we've given you. Um, so one of the important things here is how do you handle the initial interview with the client? More so than in the case of general representation. You've got to make sure the client understands what's going on with this division of, re division of uh, responsibility. And if you're smart, you're going to document that. So if there's any kind of misunderstanding later on that you have something in your file that indicates you had this conversation with the client and that everything was clear. We've tried to make that easy for you. In the materials on page 50, there's an initial client interview checklist. Best thing to do is keep this, or in the, as in the case of all these forms, modify it and make it better. Use your own form, but uh, make sure that you, when you have that first uh, meeting with the client, that you check off uh, what it is that you've agreed to do and what the client has agreed to do. As you'll see, starting on page 51, is there are some useful materials which help you to decide what the client's going to do as opposed to what you're going to do. So, for example, you're going to apportion uh, material, uh, apportion responsibilities between you and the clients. Looking at page 53, um, a list of the possible tasks. Uh, a divorce complaint, for example. Who's going to divorce? Who's going to draft the divorce uh, complaint? Who's going to file and serve the papers? Who's going to draft motions? And you better be specific about what motions you're talking about. Drafting affidavits and declarations. All the way uh, through that checklist. The more specific you can be, the better. In the divorce context, uh, people are saying that it's very helpful when they go in for temporary orders. When they go in for that first hearing uh, and they, they agree to uh, handle a matter for the client for the temporary support, 
maybe a, a, a motion to uh, uh, determine who's going to be able to stay in the House uh, during the course of the proceeding, those kinds of things. Uh, so oftentimes a case at the, uh, at the uh, probate court gets settled after the, after the temporary support orders. That's a great place to go in and really help with a client. Uh, and if you're going to do that, make sure you have this uh, task uh, apportionment all very specifically set out. The notices of limited appearance allow you to indicate that you're going in for a specific date or event, or they allow you to define an issue. In the probate context, we thought perhaps someone will want a lawyer to deal with the financial issues. So support might be a separate issue from child custody. So the client might want to handle the custody issues and have the lawyer uh, handle the financial issues. We have seen very little of that. One of the things that requires is for the lawyer and the client to be standing next to each other and separating up the hearing. You talk about financial issues, I'll talk about support. And of course, the more you think about it, the more who gets the kids is going to determine how much support is paid. So the issues are intertwined. So what we've been seeing is people that go in and do their uh, uh, limited assistance for a specific event. So you'll check off and say, I will do the temporary orders hearing on February 21st. And the lawyer goes in and handles everything that comes up on that date, uh, rather than dividing it up by issues. Is it conceivable that you could divide something up by issues? Yes. Perhaps, um, I, I know of one lawyer who said, client came in to me and uh, wanted me to go in and file an appearance in the case, uh, and there was a trial two weeks later, scheduled. I agreed to do a limited assistance representation solely on the issue of a continuance. It used to be that if you went in and filed a, an appearance to find out if you could get a continuance of the trial date, you were in. That was a general appearance. You couldn't appear just for the question of the continuance. So you took your chances. If the judge denied the continuance, you might have to represent that client in the trial in two weeks. You wanted to find out ahead of time if there was going to be a continuance. Okay, I'll represent you. If not, I won't get involved. Now you can file a limited assistance representation appearance, limited appearance, just for the continuance. And perhaps there are four things on that day. You know, a motion uh, to continue, uh, a motion to increase support, a motion to compel discovery. You can agree to say, you can say, I'm going in just for the issue of the continuance. If the continuance is denied, I'm turning around and walking out of the courtroom, and you're going to handle everything else. To me, that makes all the sense in the world, having been stuck in that, in that position at times. Uh, one of the things we were very concerned about was judges not letting lawyers out. Uh, that was a great tradition. Judge Ginsburg uh, once denied a continuance uh, to a lawyer who was on his back uh, at home, unable to get out of bed. The uh, lawyer had himself brought into court in an ambulance. They carried him in on a stretcher, and uh, Judge Ginsburg denied the continuance and would not let him withdraw. Uh, the appeals court disagreed with him on that particular one, but um, he was famous for not letting lawyers get out once they get in. And uh, we were very concerned about that uh, because that would make lo uh, lawyers very nervous about the limited assistance. Turns out we've educated the judges. They're all very much in support of LAR. We haven't had any problem with, lawyer, with uh, judges trying to keep lawyers in cases. That has just not been an issue. The judges want as many lawyers as they can involved in cases, and they will do almost anything to keep the lawyers involved. And they will not, and so they've decided they will not try to keep lawyers in if they have a limited representation, limited uh, appearance. So let's get specific about it, too. Uh, for example, uh, there's a limit notice of limited appearance uh, which appears in your papers uh, in the booklet at page 79. This is a notice of uh, limited appearance. So you can see it's fairly straightforward. Um, 
And in, in uh, paragraph one, you simply identify the attorney uh, and, the, and the party. In paragraph two, you state specifically what you're involved uh, with. And you can define it, as I said, by issue or event. Virtually everyone is doing by event because it's easier to define. You define the event that you're in for. Most people are doing one day. So I will do the event on February the 20th. Make sure that you're clear with your client that if you're in the court on February 20th and the judge hears you and says, we need some further information, go get the further information. I'm going to continue this hearing until February 28th. Make sure that, you know, that the client knows that's beyond the scope of your representation. That if you have to go in on another date, there will be another fee. And you have to negotiate with that client about that. Otherwise, you're going to end up doing multiple court appearances, uh, and you may not have arranged with the client the appropriate fee for that. So make sure you're clear about what it is that you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Um, so you file your notice of appearance. You say you're going to go in to, uh, for the motion hearing on, the, on February 21st. You file this notice of limited appearance. You serve it on the other lawyer. Um, and you go in on February 21st. You make the argument to the court. And you're done. On the way out of the courthouse, you want to file what's known as what is the notice of withdrawal. Until you file that notice of withdrawal, you are in the case. So you file your notice of appearance before you go in, and you file your notice of limited your notice of withdrawal immediately thereafter. You don't want any ambiguity about whether you're still in the case. And in part, if you look at the SJC rule, and I'm going to refer you back to that again, that's in your materials at uh, 77. You'll see that paragraph three of the SJC rules talks about service of process. This was a big issue. Uh, if you're going into court representing a client and the other side has a limited assistance lawyer, how do you know who to serve? When do you, how much do you keep that lawyer informed in the process? How much don't you? Who do you serve? This it was meant to clarify that. And the answer is, if you are a limited assistance representation lawyer, uh, you're obligated to file all your pleadings, serve them on the other side, just as you would be if you were in for a general appearance with respect to that matter. If you're on the other side and there's an LAR lawyer, you're required to serve both the lawyer and the client because that client being pro se will be at the next hearing. And it's critical that that pro se client have all the pleadings in the case. But once you file your notice of limited appearance, that's it. They don't have to serve you anymore, and they really shouldn't be serving you anymore. File your notice of withdrawal. Serve that on the other side. Again, a lawyer recently I was uh, talking with who was doing LAR said, when I go in, I file my notice of limited appearance and my withdrawal before the hearing. And I said, well, it doesn't quite make sense. I mean, if you're withdrawn, how do you appear at the hearing? She said, well, in the probate court, they kind of wink and they stick it in the back of the file. And uh, I go in and do my appearance. That way, there's no ambiguity about it. And I thought, well, <laughs> I guess. Uh, it's better to do it on the way out, I think. Um, but we specifically provided that you don't have to tell the judge. You don't have to ask the judge's permission. The judge doesn't have a right to keep you in the case. You don't have to tell the judge, I'm leaving after this, I'm filing my notice of withdrawal. You don't ask permission. That's, and, and that was because of this nervousness we had about judges keeping people in. Turns out it hasn't been an issue. Last time we did this training with Judge Winnick, he said, I want to know if somebody's in with a limited appearance and if they're going to withdraw. He said, perhaps there's an issue that uh, is involved in this case which we could resolve uh, that day if I know it has to be resolved that day. We can send them out in the corridor and have them come back in for a second call. Uh, I'm much less likely to continue the hearing if I know there's a limited appearance. Um, I want to accommodate that lawyer. So it may be important for, you, for you, know, you to let the court know. You'll have to feel that out in the individual courts in which you appear to determine whether or not you're going to let the court know 
And what's the best way to do that? We provided that you don't have to do that. You don't have to let the court know. Uh, so those are a couple of uh, helpful uh, practical hints, I hope. Um, we also included in the materials a client handout. As I said, informed consent is a critical part of this. So on page 34 in the materials, you'll see that there's a handout that we've prepared uh, that you can give to a client so that there's a record of what it is that you gave to the client. And it's in very simple uh, language. And it is something that is very helpful for the client to get because they may have heard about limited assistance representation without knowing fully what their responsibilities are um, and uh, uh, what they need to know about it. So think about giving out that to hand out or, again, customizing it for your own use. Um, I, we talked about the initial checklist. Uh, we talked about the task mm -hmm. apportionment. Uh, another very important part of this is fee agreements. Um, yeah, now under the SJC, new SJC rule, you have to have a fee agreement anyway. Very important in the case of limited assistance representation. So that everybody knows uh, what everybody else is doing. There's no particular reason why you have to charge differently for LAR than you do for a general practice. You can charge by the hour. You can set that up and the lawyer, the Lori Unflat has a practice in Wellesley who has been doing a lot of LAR said she always charges by the hour because even though your appearance is limited, you still can't predict exactly how much time you're going to have to be involved. And if you budget for three hours in court and you're only in there for one, it's not fair to the client, she feels. So she charges on the basis of an hourly rate. Um, I always thought that with the LAR, it's uh, a great way to charge a flat fee, which the client could be very comfortable with. One important thing is you can file an LAR limited appearance, go in, represent the court, uh, the client in a, in a proceeding on one particular day, file your notice of withdrawal, and the next day file a new limited appearance for a new event. We're hoping that once clients see how important it is to have lawyers and what a great job you do for them, that they're going to want you to be there in the next, at the next hearing. And people in general, if you ask them, lawyers don't come out very well on popularity polls. But lawyers do great when they ask clients, do you like your lawyer and is your lawyer doing a great job for you? They tend to think very highly of their lawyer, particularly if they get to see that lawyer uh, doing some hard work for them and being zealous in court. So you can do a series of limited, assist, limited representations and um, you can do them on flat fees. Perhaps if they do two limited uh, limited uh, representation appearances, they'll decide that they, they do want to hire you in general for the whole case. Um, you know, it's, it hopefully is going to result in more lawyers being in court and more business for lawyers. Uh, the fee agreement that you see in here um, is a very sim simple fee agreement on uh, page 57. That's if a client comes in and wants to just do a consult for one day. Um, and uh, you can do that on a limited assistance basis. That's kind of along the idea of what I talked about earlier with your reviewing a purchase and sale agreement for somebody. Um, on the next page is a consulting services agreement where you can consult on an ongoing basis um, to give the client coaching about what they need to talk to the court about on a particular day. Um, Page 62, there's an ongoing consulting agreement that's more than one event. On page 68 is the limited assistance fee agreement, uh, which involves a court appearance. Always, you can change these forms. Uh, but what we've tried to do is to give you here uh, good, helpful forms that have turned out to be very helpful over time to people doing this kind of a practice. and. Uh, to make it uh, as easy to get started as, uh, as it can be. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the ethical part, uh, the fact that, uh, as I said earlier, we're not having problems at the uh, Board of Bar Overseers, but the important thing is to remember that the basic ethical concepts 
for limited representation are the same as they are for general representation. There's no change in the attorney-client privilege. There's no change in maintaining client confidences. There's no change in being zealous on behalf of your client on that uh, event or issue that you've agreed to represent them on. If you remember those things, then you're not going to end up in trouble on the ethical side. The one thing I will say is this informed consent requirement in the rule puts an additional burden on you to make sure that the client understands. So that's the, those are important concepts uh, for you to remember. Um, now, what happens if you do a fee agreement and you're in court and the judge says, well, it's fine that you're here today on uh, temporary, uh, a temporary order regarding custody, uh, but we also need to start resolving this issue about support. Uh, why don't you address the court about support? Well, you, you know, you need to say to the court, we weren't prepared, that wasn't marked up for today. Um, I, I haven't agreed to do that. Very important. If you've got a limited appearance in place, don't fudge it. Mm -hmm. When you're in court on the 21st and, there's a, and you've done the hearing on temporary support, and the, and the court says, well, we need to decide custody, so we'll have a hearing on the 28th. Uh, counsel, are you available on the 28th? You need to be clear. Uh, no, and that judge, I'm not, I've got to talk to my client, but I haven't, I haven't been retained on that issue or for that event. What you don't want to do is somehow slide into that event and end up filing, you know, some papers, pleadings on the question of, uh, of support. Once you're outside of your specific notice of limited representation, if you file any additional pleadings, if you agree to, to fudge it and get more generally involved in the case, it is a general appearance. At that point, you're subject to Rule 11 in the same way that you would have been if you'd filed a general appearance, and you're going to have to get the court's uh, approval to get out and file a motion to withdraw. Just don't do it. In particular, don't be pressured because of an emergency uh, to go beyond what you've agreed to do. You can always ask uh, to be uh, held for a second call, take a few minutes, go out in the corridor, agree with your client on some change in the scope of what you're doing. Even better, go back to your office, file your notice of withdrawal that day, go back to your office, have the client come in the next day, and if you want to do the next event, agree to do the next event, do another agreement. There is in the materials a change of scope agreement, a change of scope letter. That appears at page 72. If you're going to go into court and you find it coming up in your practice with LAR, bring one of these with you. If it comes up during the course of the hearing that you're being asked to, to address something else or to, to uh, act beyond the scope of your ex specific notice of limited representation, you can execute a change of scope letter. Just make sure that you don't fudge it and slip over into a general appearance. That's, that would be a mistake for a number of reasons. When you're all done with your limited assistance representation, uh, what you should do is send the client a, a closing letter. That appears on page 75. Now, a lot of lawyers will tell you this is a good idea anyway. After you're done with an engagement, write the client a letter so the client doesn't somehow think that you're continuing to represent them if, in fact, you're not taking that on. I know a lot of estate planners uh, that will do a will and a trust, get the full executed estate plan, uh, give the client, mail a copy of the estate plan to the client along with a letter that says, that's it, I'm done, uh, and that's the end of my engagement. Uh, if you have any other questions or you want more work, be in touch with me. Well, to my mind, that's a dumb thing to do if you're doing estate planning. You want them to call you back. Uh, and in fact, you might want to, if there are changes in the law, update clients and invite them to come back for changes. But in the case of a litigated matter, especially if it's a limited assistance matter, it's a good idea to keep those lines clear. Make sure they know that you're out. This is not required. It's just really good practice. Uh, think about doing it so that, the, so that those lines 
aren't blurred in any way. Um, any questions so far on the things I've been uh, talking about? Yes. Okay, the question is, in what courts can you do LAR? And the answer is, uh, the Superior Court has not adopted it. Um, and uh, as far as I know, and I, I know, it's not in the appellate courts because no one's asked the question until about two days ago. And uh, Judge Cohen from the Appeals Court, who was the chair of our task force, will be asked that question. Um, in the appellate context, it's a little bit uh, unusual because, of course, normally it's just one event, which is the appellate argument. But I don't see why uh, you couldn't uh, uh, prepare a brief for a client to file uh, or help them with uh, assembling the record appendix or help them with some kind of an interlocutory uh, motion uh, and then allow the client to do the argument if they want to. So not in the appellate courts, not in the superior court. It also applies only to civil cases. Uh, it doesn't apply in the juvenile court. And it doesn't apply on the criminal side at the BMC. All those existing rules about appearances remain the same. Uh, the housing court, the land court, the district court, the probate and family court have adopted it. Did I miss any? Nope. OK. Uh, I would not be surprised to see the Superior Court adopted at some point. The attitude of the Superior Court is, our cases are too important. Uh, and they involve too much money to allow this kind of thing to go on. You know, we need lawyers. Uh, but the result is they just end up with more pro se litigants. Uh, and there are certain kinds of cases in the Superior Court where there are a lot of pro se litigants. Almost all the neighbor disputes, you know, your tree's hanging over my property and it looks like it's about to fall on my roof. Or next week, your tree did fall on my roof. Or you've built your garage on my property. It's almost always pro se litigants. I predict that uh, when this really gets going and it's working well in all the other courts and they see that there's not a problem, uh, that it will be approved in the Superior Court. We're not encouraging pro se litigants. Every time you try to do something that deals with the issue of pro se litigants, somebody will stand up and say, all you're doing is making it easier for the pro se litigants. And we're going to see more of them, not uh, fewer of them. That is not the goal, and that's not uh, the experience. What we're hoping to do is have more contact between lawyers and clients, knowing, confident, that the more clients see lawyers, the more they're going to see the benefit of what it is you do. And the more comfortable they are with the certainty of how much it's going to cost them, the more they're going to be willing to take that leap and perhaps do it in a serial way. So that's, that's our hope. I think that it's also been clear that folks, um, the last person uh, that folks want to pay is their lawyer. They really do resent the money that goes out for the lawyer. So when, when it happens in this um, set fee or um, paid in advance and they get what they've asked for and get what they've paid for, people are, are, their satisfaction level is much higher, I think, as well. Yeah, I, just on that point. It astounds me that people are willing to come into my office and say, yes, I want you to represent me in this case. And I tell them, OK, I'm going to file a general appearance. I'm going to do whatever uh, it, we need to do uh, to win this case. I'll keep you informed. We'll work on it together. But how much it'll cost, I can't tell you. I, I, people always ask for a budget. I don't, and, you know, you're required under the federal rules to, to give a budget. Um, I don't know how you do that. Um, and uh, if it's a big enough matter and a sophisticated enough client, fine. But for an awful lot of people out there, giving you a blank check to represent them with a general appearance on a divorce matter must be about the scariest thing they've ever seen. Um, so we're hoping to deal with some of that. And you had a question? It is not required. Uh, you do not have to have that to file this. The client does not have a right to keep you in the case. Uh, but 
it's great to have it as an acknowledgement. Most people will tell you that they have the client sign that before they go into court. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the agreement, and there's no reason they shouldn't sign it so that it doesn't come up afterwards, and so that if that's going to be a problem, you hear about it before it's an issue. At, at housing court, when we fill out both of those forms, the appearance and the withdrawal, at the same time, so that when the attorney goes in on the limited appearance, they have that withdrawal in their hand. And I, I guess uh, for, the, for the video, too, just to make sure, since you don't have a microphone, uh, we should be repeating the questions. And the question was, in the materials on page 81, there's a notice of withdrawal that provides a line for the client to sign. Not required, but a good idea. It hasn't come up in housing court uh, because I think what we do mostly there is sort of um, serial LAR. Um, we'll make an appearance and then somebody will make an appearance in the next step of that. I think that um, what I have heard about in probate court, court when people make a notice of appearance for a day, uh, the court really tries to get as much done in that day as they possibly can so that the client does not come back pro se the next time. So it really encourages the court not to give um, continuances or not to, or to drag out making a decision in a case. I could see where, where we as legal services would question that. Um, I don't think it hits up against the reasonableness requirement for an attorney if they agree to appear in one um, piece of the case, realize that maybe the client isn't going to do such a good job. It'll be up to the client then, and I would certainly, as an attorney, advise them of that. It appears to me that it might be very difficult for you to, um, to do jury instructions in a jury trial. Um, you might want to consider a further LAR appearance by either me, if you're pleased with my um, performance here, or if you're unwilling or didn't do such a good job, um, they can go on to someone else. Yeah. And, and so the question here, too, is the uh, requirement in the SJC rule of reasonableness and has it come up uh, that uh, there have been allegations that uh, lawyers have been handling parts of the case that were not reasonable? For example, a motion to dismiss if the client really isn't capable of handling the subsequent trial if, it's, if that motion to dismiss is denied. The answer is it hasn't come up specifically and it hasn't really been an issue. <clears throat> In the circumstance you described where you might be filing a notice of limited appearance to do the motion to dismiss, um, I don't think that is going to be something that is necessarily intertwined with everything else that's going to happen later. Um, that might be exactly the kind of motion that would make sense to do because it's potentially dispositive. A little bit like the continuance motion I mentioned, which is it's kind of all or nothing. Um, if the motion is denied, then you've done a great job and you've, uh, you know, you've done your best and the client's going to have to pick up just where they would anyway. Uh, so you haven't really prejudiced the client uh, by handling that matter for them. And if they couldn't handle the trial anyway, you haven't in any way uh, set them back. If it's allowed, then you've done a great job and that's a wonderful thing. Um, in fact, uh, this uh, limited assistance representation has been used by legal services. Uh, and one of the issues that uh, Pauline Curian talks about, who does family law for GBLS, is that she'll be a court and uh, uh, there'll be a client there uh, in tears uh, who's been the subject of abuse by her husband, just, and this is just a common set of facts, um, and she's at the probate court, uh, doesn't know what to do, uh, is completely lost on her own, um, tried to get a hearing scheduled for that day, didn't know anything about how to make service on the other side, uh, didn't know what to ask the court for, and 
it, Pauline is there and figuring she's already got five times as many cases as she could possibly handle. But this is a crisis that really needs some help right away. Uh, turns out her other case that she's there on is on second call or someone hasn't shown up. This way she can file a notice of limited appearance for that person for that day, spend an hour, do the best she can to help that person, and know that uh, she's not stuck for the whole case. And uh, so it's a very uh, helpful way to be able to help somebody on a discrete issue. Um, the other thing that happens here is that uh, somebody comes into your office, you, you talk to them for you know an hour, and you're really you're willing to represent them, but you're really not 100% sure whether or not they're giving you the straight facts, or whether this person really may be one of those clients that is really a, uh, a difficult client, and you're going to end up with a lot of trouble. Maybe the person is emotionally disturbed. A lot of people who are doing divorce work are disturbed. It's hard to tell whether or not this is the client that you don't want. Turning down the client you don't want is really important, as most of us will find out, more important than taking the clients you do want. LAR allows you to sign up for one event. You can go to court and, you know, Lord forbid you show up for that temporary support hearing. Uh, you appear in front of the court. The other side is represented. Uh, you've got an affidavit that, you, that you've given to the court stating a certain set of facts, and the other side shows up with you know, three inches worth of employment records that prove that your client's been lying to you. Um, if you file the general appearance, you're in that case anyway. Um, and that may not be the case you want to be in. If you're doing LAR, uh, you have the right at that point to say, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, I represented you today, but uh, I'm not, I can't represent you going forward. So it does give you an opportunity to kind of test drive your client, just as it gives the client the opportunity to test drive the lawyer. Um, so maybe you'll end up with more happy relationships that way um, and uh, higher, uh, uh, higher percentage of being paid. So it might be a good thing for both people. We had one concern uh, when we were implementing this in the housing court about getting a copy of the decision in the case because as you're leaving, you filed your notice of withdrawal, so you're, you are not the attorney of record in this case, so you don't get a copy of the decision. And the way we've worked that out as housing court is that we can, we go back, because we're there every week, we go back and review those cases to see what the decision is. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, have a, another notice of limited appearance or another um, a limited appearance with your client or limited um, retainer that says that you will review the decision with them. Uh, once they get the decision and have them, they can bring that back. So um, that can solve that problem. Okay. Um, Any other questions before we? A couple of things I wanted to mention before we go. Um, well, I still have some one last thing I want to hit. Still going. Well, you go ahead. <laughs> um, very helpful materials at page 36 in your materials. Best practices. Again, I think you'll find this very readable, and it is just you know, uh, LAR does raise some different. Uh, different challenges, uh, and you need to be sensitized to them. Read through these materials, you'll be sensitized to them. It's not a completely different animal, but it's, uh, it is a little bit different from what you've been used to. So look through these best practices. It talks about some of the things I've already mentioned, um, but it's, it's very helpful, and uh, you may be able to save yourself uh, a lot of headaches into the future by looking at those materials and uh, making sure that you uh, are engaged in what uh, have been determined to be the best practices. In California, they've been doing this for, you know, 10 years. Um, so we have the benefit of all their thoughts. Uh, Maine, they've been doing it for six or seven years. We have the benefit of their thoughts, and we have the benefit of our experience here. So uh, it's all been wound into those best practices and to these materials. Okay, any other questions? All right, so. If you do have questions later on, again, pl please feel free to email them to, uh, to me at VLP. If it's not my area of expertise, I will make sure it gets to someone who is. Um, I just want to take a couple of minutes to 
Um, thank the BBA that provides this training at no cost for attorneys. Take a look at the BBA website, all the things that are available to new attorneys and um, experienced attorneys. And for folks that the membership cost may be a problem, they actually have um, reduced uh, membership costs for folks who need it, so don't, don't hesitate to ask. Also keep an eye on their website for trainings that they do on a regular basis that are at no cost and you don't have to be a member. And then I know I put a plug in at the beginning for the Volunteer Lawyers Project, um, and it is not just self-interest that makes me say it's a great place to get involved. If you're looking for an opportunity for pro bono, you're an experienced attorney, you want to do something but you don't know how to find it, VLP is the place. If you're a new attorney and you feel sort of cut loose out there, you don't have anybody to back you up, it's a great place to take cases and get mentors and get assistance. Um, our executive director is here today, Sheila Hubbard. So um, folks are at VLP are always in support of, of people who are looking for new ways of practice and new ways of uh, engaging in pro bono practice. So thank you for coming. Don't forget, you stay in here for the BMC. Uh, you go upstairs for, for the housing court. And again, all of these, including the four, ultimately four breakout sessions, will be on the VLP YouTube channel, um, which you can watch in, um, at your leisure. Thank you.